Manchester, Vermont. For over 30 years, the character of the stark Vermont landscape has been painted by the distinguished American artist Luigi Lucioni. A 20th century Renaissance man, Luigi Lucioni has brought the classicism and the craftsmanship from the old world to the clabbered farm buildings and the rolling hills of the Green Mountains. And his heightened realistic style captures the essence of the Vermont scene. highly detailed character of Lucioni paintings produce compositions that are quiet and peaceful and a relief from the explosive character in much of contemporary art. The paintings present simplified details of nature that affords the eye of the viewer the liberty of contemplation. The surface texture of Lucioni's work has a pristine enamel-like quality that practically eliminates the track of the brush and has some affinity with the Flemish masters as well as the Italian painters of the 15th century. The small village of Manchester, Vermont has been the inspiration for many of the artist's paintings. Everyone in the area has seen Luigi set up his portable easel by the streets of the village, on the fields, and in the mountains that surround the town. But few of the natives realize that the Lucioni paintings are highly prized and have been exhibited at the most important art galleries in the country, such as the National Academy, the Chicago Art Institute, the Pennsylvania Academy, the Carnegie Institute and the Corcoran Art Gallery, and purchased for permanent display by the Whitney and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. All right, Robin, come on, it's time to pack. It's six o'clock. I put in my eight hours today, so I guess it's all right. You see, I usually start around eight in the morning and I work until noon. Then I go home for lunch and I come back and I work until about 6 o'clock. That's my regular routine and I really enjoy it very much. You see, I like to paint right on the subject because, well, it's a challenge. And of course, I don't paint it exactly the way it is. You know, I sometimes move a mountain, a tree, leave out a church steeple or move a church steeple in. Depends the way. When I first came to Vermont many years ago, I fell in love with the state. I was felt reborn and I felt as though I was back in northern Italy again. And of course I'd be coming back every summer to paint here. It's quite a challenge, but I enjoyed it. I like it very much. Come on, Robin, let's go. Come on. All right, come on, come on. Lucioni first became aware of the rugged challenge of the Vermont landscape as a youth when he visited relatives in Barrie, Vermont. And thereafter, he set himself the task of capturing the mood of the austere Vermont scenes on his canvases. Luigi Lucioni was born in 1900 in northern Italy near Milan. As a child, he showed unusual talent in drawing and so attended art school. When he was 10 years old, his family moved to the United States where Luigi continued with his art studies. And at 15, he attended the Cooper Union School of Art and studied with the eminent teacher William Starkweather. At 19, he was accepted by the National Academy of Art and received a Tiffany Foundation scholarship. After four more years of schooling, Luigi was attracted to the museums of Europe. 
and in France and Italy, he studied the paintings of the Impressionists and of the Renaissance artists. On his return to America, he set up his studio in New York City. And there, on Washington Square, he worked furiously, full of inspiration from his study abroad, until he was able to open his first one-man show in 1927. This farmhouse in Manchester was purchased by Lucioni in 1939 after he decided that he would continue painting the Vermont scenery. The little Yorkshire Terrier, Robin, follows his master wherever he goes. With his two sisters, Alice and Aurora, he spends his summers in Vermont and his winters in New York City. The barn on the Manchester property has been comfortably converted into the artist's studio, and it is often filled with the recorded music of the opera of his native Italy during the artist's painting sessions. Well, here I am at the end of the day. I usually, when I come inside, work about 15 minutes or a half an hour to touch up to see if there's any hair or dirt and things like that, and I use my magnifying glass to look carefully. Well, there isn't anything so far. And I w work on two things today. One in the morning, that's the one that is waiting for, for me to go out tomorrow morning. And this is my afternoon painting. And I usually work about five or six months. It takes me a couple of summers to do them. Years ago, I used to be able to do one in the morning and one in the afternoon, all in one summer. But as I grow older, I either expect more of myself or I'm getting slower. I don't know, whatever it is, I have to have all this time to work. Now, I don't know what I'm called. I suppose if I had to be named something, I would be called a realist. However, I don't really know much about pop art or op art. It's all right, it doesn't bother me. It's all right for them, and I don't care what happens. But as long as they let me do what I please. Of course, I have the greatest admiration for Cezanne and Renoir and Degas and the French Impressionist. But I even have greater admiration for the great Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Michelangelo, Piero della Francesca, Mantegna. If I were, had my choice to be like one or the other, I think I would try to ask for the Renaissance. But, however, I don't have my choice. So I do the best I can, and I hope that my message gets over to the public. celebration and in recognition of Luigi Lucioni's art, which has been appreciated in America for over 30 years, the Shelburne Museum of Early Americana in 1968 collected a lone exhibition of the representative paintings that cover the complete painting life of this fine artist. The paintings of Lucioni, owned by various museums and private collectors, traveled here in the Lake Champlain town of Shelburne, Vermont, from all over the country. This museum community of fine old New England buildings contain the treasures of the folk art of pioneer America, including paintings, wood carvings, quilts and rugs, dolls and toys, sleighs and carriages, and even a steam locomotive, authentic Americana. On a hill overlooking the grounds, the SS Ticonderoga, the last of the coal-burning side-wheeler lake boats, overlooks the web gallery of American art that permanently exhibits the paintings of the finest American artists from John Copley to Andrew Wyeth. Here, the Luigi Lucioni loan collection was on display. Owners were willing to part temporarily with their paintings in order to make this exhibition possible. 69 paintings in watercolor and oils 
and 31 etchings, representing Lucioni's painting years from 1923 to the present were collected. Pairs with Pewter, a canvas by Luigi Lucioni, was purchased by the Metropolitan in 1931. Mr. Norman Kent, editor of the magazine American Artist. At the time it, of its purchase by the museum, it represented the youngest American painter to enter the collection. What is there about this canvas that recommended it to the museum that made it worthy of, of, of purchase by so young an artist? Let's look at some of the detail. Note the fine rendering of the cloth, the transparency of the glass, the lively surface of the pears, and the rather dry character of the surface of the pewter. Also, the, the rather quiet and reserved color of the whole canvas, so characteristic of Lucioni's painting. Now let's look at some of the other paintings in the collection. Only an artist of great and long experience would undertake a subject as difficult as this. The light flickering through the pattern of these trees has been handled with great accomplishment. In this canvas, the artist has produced an amazing effect of space and distance, contrived through the use of cool color and an effective design of tree and mountain. This canvas, entitled Two Willows, is owned by the famous Whitney Museum of American Art, located in New York. Everyone can appreciate this canvas more if he takes into account the effect of the powerful thrusts of the two trees. This whole landscape is activated by the powerful obliques, which are made up by the limbs and trunks of these trees. In this canvas, the big shadow, Lucioni has really painted a portrait of a lovely summer afternoon. Notice how effectively he has illuminated the red silo in contrast to the shadowed foreground and the sunlight flickering through the trees and the texture of the large tree in the foreground. Now this same general characteristic is to be found in the watercolor. But in this instance, we are faced with the fall and its beautiful foliage. See how effectively Lucioni has exploited the color and the texture and the pattern of the light coming through these autumn colored leaves with the effective shadow on the house and the barn. This is one of the most highly detailed watercolors in the whole collection. And yet the artist, through the means of composition, forces the eye of the beholder around and through the whole composition, leading us out between the buildings to the vista beyond. We know from our discussions with him that he makes a very tight pencil drawing preliminary to the beginning of his watercolor washes. And this accounts in no small measure for the fact that all of the forms, all of the patterns, have been calculated and contrived to achieve this handsome end. This is a majestic canvas, and only one who is thoroughly familiar with its substance and, thir and thoroughly in love with its atmosphere could have achieved such a beautiful result. Bright color and hard edge make this a very gay, inviting canvas. Artists are often asked why time-worn things appeal to them more than new and shiny ones. And the reason for this is that those things which have been aged have character and ease, whereas things that are new lack it. The low eye level of this oil painting has given this clump of trees a majestic appearance. How very faithful this artist has been to the natural Vermont landscape, and particularly to its majestic trees. 
No artist that I know of has made more capital of tree forms and tree patterns than Lucioni. This oil painting, entitled The Brick House, presents the home of the late Mrs. Electra Havemeyer Webb. It is seen foiled against Lake Champlain with the mountains in the distance. And in the immediate foreground, a handsome elm, so very characteristic of Vermont. Now we move over to this watercolor, which is so highly regarded by the artist as well as myself, that I learned today that he has retained it in his private collection. One can well understand his affection for this painting, for unlike so many of his others, it has a large massed quality which recommends it particularly to artists and makes it a very effective presentation of his watercolor technique. Expressive drawing is at the base of all of Lucioni's work, particularly evident in his portraits. And in this one of his sister, it is this Renaissance-like draftsmanship that has given the portrait its, its expressive character. Perhaps nothing in the whole realm of figurative painting is more difficult than the self-portrait. Lucioni has painted a mirror image of himself when he was in his 40s. In this oil painting, the ninth hole, Lucioni has attempted a very difficult motive, the painting of birches foiled against a sunlit background of mountains and sky. Many artists have attempted to paint birches, but few have accomplished it as well as he. Luigi Lucioni is an artist of great stature. For years, he has been identified with the traditional realist movement in American painting. And he has not been swayed by the various facets of American art that have taken so many into the field of abstraction. His particular place has to do with a very special vision that has accounted for a large volume of paintings carefully wrought over a period of more than 30 years. The fact that his work is to be found in many distinguished private collections, as well as many museum collections, is evidence of his special work. But it, in his vision, Lucioni has a special uniqueness that is quite his own. I believe that the work of this important artist will live long beyond his own time. For it speaks in a common language that all men can understand and that even the art critics cannot help but respect. You know, one of the problems about being an artist is the paintings that you keep yourself. You don't know what's going to happen to you after you've gone. And I've decided I'm going to leave some of them to the Shelburne Museum. And among them, I'm going to leave the portrait of my father, which I consider the best portrait I've ever done. You know, when I was young, I didn't appreciate my father very much. But as I grew old, I began to understand that he had a lot of courage to leave a small town in northern Italy and come to America and bring a family over five children, a new country. So I really began to appreciate what a wonderful man he was. Later on, when he was, well, he was already 75 when I painted his portrait, I had quite a wonderful time with him because he had a kind of a hard, bluff exterior, which was just an exterior, I mean. But like all Italian men, they want to show that they are the master of the family. But I got underneath that exterior, and while I painted his portrait, I was very much interested in his hands because he had had arthritis at that time, and I tried to show that because he had been quite a fine craftsman in copper and things like that. And, and there's also a little bit of symbolism that I don't know whether people have noticed in the painting. There's a little flame in the corner of the, of the fireplace which shows that he is still life left in him. And uh, I try to put that in. And you know, I feel that uh, I'm very happy that I'm leaving 
what I consider my best portrait to the Shelburne Museum. I have these days when I'm terribly discouraged. It's awful. Well, what can I do? I mean, if I don't have any greater talent than this, it's not my fault. For instance, I'm crazy about opera, and, and I love to play the piano. I'm absolutely terrible at it. I don't have any talent, I know. I practice every day, but I don't get anywhere. So people say, well, why do you waste your time? Well, to give me that I enjoy myself. And I keep saying, well, I wasn't given any bigger talent than this, so, so what can I do? I mean, that's the best that I can do, and that's that. Oh, I don't let anybody listen to me, except my sisters. They may while they're washing the breakfast dishes. But it's true. In life, you do the best you can, and that's the best you can do. You can't help it if you don't have any bigger talent than that. It's not your fault. I find Vermont similar to Northern Italy, but Italy is so beautiful and picturesque that all you do is to set up an easel and copy. Now in Vermont, on the other hand, you have to compose a bit. You have to take one thing from another and put it together, but still you don't make it look as though it was made up. Vermont is beautiful, but, but it's not romantic. What I like about Vermont, it doesn't go out of its way to attract one. It's there, it's rugged, it, it's austere, it's rather cold at times, but it's there, and you have to go to it. It's a great challenge. I'm very much interested in reality, and I'm sorry that people call it photographic. I don't think that's right. Because if you photograph a scene, it's not the same as if you painted it. Because I make quite a few changes in my composition. But people don't know that, and when they say, oh, it looks so real, they don't realize that I have moved some trees and a couple of mountains. You know, nature is confusion. In my paintings, I try to clarify that confusion, to, to bring out the reality that makes it seem real, without copying it. You have, to le you have to leave out. You can't reproduce nature. But you must know the essential thing that makes things seem absolutely real. It's selection. You cannot intelligently leave out what you don't know how to intelligently put in. If you're going to leave something out, Unless you know, unless you've been able to put anything in, you don't know what the essential thing is to leave out. Uh, I think the public has come to a point where they, they want to understand what paintings are all about. Uh, they like to recognize things. If you paint a tree, uh, they want it to look like a tree not the essence of a tree, or the spirit of a tree, or how you feel about a tree. You know, that's a little absurd. It's not how you feel about a tree, it's how the rest of the public feels about it. At least, if you call your painting a tree, it's got to look like a tree. Uh, I paint trees to look like trees. I, I don't paint it to look like something else. Well, everything I paint, I paint to look like what it is. You know, one thing I am, well, I'm honest. A, a 
great deal of it is not glamour, you know. Uh, lots of people think, oh, you feel like painting, you paint. <laughs> That's hokum. It, it isn't true at all. Whether you feel like painting or not, you make yourself do it. You can be very, very tired, but you just go ahead and do it. Because it's a job like anything else. It's not a great gift or anything like that. It's just something that you have to work at. It's hard work, all the time. But, but everything is hard work. Not only being an artist. You know, I think a painting has to move me tremendously. It's an emotion that you really can't describe. I don't think you could possibly describe it. If I were a poet, I might be able to do it verbally, but I'm not a poet. I'm just a painter. And, for instance, when I'm in front of an empty canvas, I have to be moved tremendously before I do anything, and I'm very, very nervous. Then when I get going, it's a great challenge, and I think the doing of a painting is more important than anything else. Well, I think in, in life anyway, people have to do something in order to feel alive. And that's the only time I feel alive. When I get towards the end of a painting, I'm not so crazy about the idea of signing it. And I always think the next one is going to be much better. Very seldom is. But it's a pure emotion that I do hope gets over to the public without all the intellectual and the technical facilities and everything. The emotion is the most important thing in a painting. You know, an artist has to realize his limitations. You know, some things in nature you just can't paint. In the late afternoon, when I get through painting, when the sun is down and I see those beautiful birch trees and the colors, I have this feeling, you know, it's, it's almost like a feeling of religion a kind of holiness about you. And you say, you can't possibly paint that. And I know I can't paint it. But it's that feeling, it's, it's kind of awe-inspiring. I, I love to work. And I hope I'm leaving good tracks, a little mark of some kind. Oh, I don't expect to be immortal or, or anything like that. But it is important to leave something behind, so you just didn't come on earth and go out like nothing. I mean, no matter how good or how bad it is, I, I try to leave something. Now, some people find their immortality in their children. Well, I'm not married, and maybe I'm the end of a regime that wasn't supposed to happen. So I try to find that in my work and leave something. I don't know how good or how bad it is, but I do the best I can. And that's all I can do. But it, it is the best I can do. For more classic programs, visit vermontpbs.org slash from the archives.